Right, right. Um, I'm really happy to say we have Leela Parasa um, with us. Um, Eli is like a um, legend. Um, I remember, I think I first came across your work in maybe like 2012, um, thinking about the sort of bubbles, but in just um, looking you up, I um, realised that actually there was like a whole uh, 10 years of um, activism and thinking about the internet and communities prior to that. And we're really happy to have you join us today, um, partly to talk about your new program, uh, Civic Signals, but equally to kind of think about just more generally how we can um, use technology in ways that are um, better for um, more of us. Um, and I, and I, so I suppose I'd. Um, It'd be great if you could start by telling us about uh, the civic signals, please. Sure, yeah, and thanks so much for having me on and for all the work that you've been doing over the years. It's been an inspiration and um, really, really important insights. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so yeah, so Civic Signals is a project that um, I started with Talia Stroud, who's a communications professor at the University of Texas, Austin. And it's really, um, you know, both Tally and I got drawn in after 2016 to this conversation about, um, about, I'm just realizing my kids are making noise. That's Give me one fine, minute. it's fine. <laughs> there you go. Just for the, for your viewers sake, you don't want to, you don't want to hear all the screaming. And that, the cats and yeah. The no, it's, um, <laughs> So, okay, so 2016, um, you know, in the United States, the conversation about kind of the role of social platforms and political polarization and misinformation, all that stuff really heated up. And the thing that Talia and I both, both noticed was that that conversation tended to center on, um, you know, how do we reduce disinformation and misinformation? How do we stop hateful attacks online? Um, all of which is really important, but, to us, it sort of left out this other set of really important questions, which is, um, well, how do we make sure that the, the good stuff uh, gets heard and seen? And, um, and uh, how do we make sure that, you know, that, that sometimes you can get so fo focused on reducing the bad that you don't always do the things that most, you know, promote the good. And so what does that even look like in digital space? And so um, Civic Signals really started as a research project trying to understand um, what are the principles of um, you know, healthy digital places. And as we went along, we started realizing um, you know, a lot of these questions really weren't novel, especially when we started considering instead of kind of thinking about feeds and ranking of information, we started thinking about digital platforms as spaces. We started realizing like, oh, there's all of this wisdom already about how people organize strangers in space from urban planning and from other disciplines. And so that's really kind of where it got cranking. And uh, what an amazingly prescient time to start thinking about <laughs> um, that last year. And I mean, I think no one really predicted what would happen in the last uh, year in terms of the amount of life that has moved on online. And um, last time we had uh, Caroline Cinders uh, come to talk to us and we were talking about how a lot of tools that have been made for um, business have now been kind of, you know, like uh, changed and um, modded into being the place that we have uh, uh, choirs and yoga class and meetups and all those um, things. Yeah. And I think like particularly for this program, one of the things we're really interested in is is like how how do you how do you bring like the spirit of the community hall to the internet? 
like that space that people can come in and change and put posters up and sort of turn into their own? Yeah. No, I think that's a critical question. And it speaks to, you know, as as Caroline says, and she's such a smart observer of this stuff, but, um, you know, I mean, we're, one of the one of the functions of being in kind of massive scale digital commercial platforms um, is that there's a huge um, kind of focus on homogeneity because that's what allows for a very quick scale and iteration. Um, and um, at the same time, when you look at really vital and flourishing communities, um, yeah, they're particular and they're situated and they have um, individuals that often take on these key kind of maintenance and stewardship roles. And so um, I think it's a fundamental tension between the like scale dreams of Silicon Valley and the very um, contextual way in which healthy human life usually occurs. And so part of what I think we, we do need is to kind of find ways to sort of create some more lo local agency and control if you wanna think about it that way. Um, and also create the kinds of spaces that um, allow people to build a sense of shared identity and norms, which is one of the things that I think is lacking in a, like a, a, a Twitter. And even I was, I was listening to your TED uh, talk um, and the thing about how in the room, we're all able to sort of look away and be slightly awkward and to um, telegraph th things to each other. And how um, those kind of affordances don't really work digitally, or we've not introduced them. We've not yeah. said, there's going to be a, a moment when everyone is uncomfortable and they're going to behave like this. Ah. Right. No. The, the, so what I was talking about in the TED talk was, um, you know, in when you want to communicate, like I'm annoyed with the person talking right now in real space, you do it in these like subtle, not so subtle ways. But, you know, you kind of roll your eyes or you cough or you, mm -hmm. you know, look at someone else. Um, and uh, it, it, in digital space, those things are often, you know, really binary. It's like, I'm gonna block this person or I'm not. I'm gonna report them and they're gonna get hauled off the platform or, or they're not. Um, or I'm gonna kind of blast them or I'm not. And there aren't these more subtle gradients. And, um, you know, that's really important for all of us um, because, uh, you know, human communication is this incredibly difficult and nuanced thing. And so, um, you know, there's times uh, where I feel like we're gonna we're gonna look back on this whole era and just sort of laugh at trying to communicate as a civilization in 180 characters of text. Like it just seems like there's a world that, there's a way of looking at it where it's just like, well, of course that's gonna run into trouble um, because you know people are have enough trouble communicating when they can communicate totally naturally. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's I. Uh bring um, this up loads, but I think it's um, fascinating. There was a study I read earlier in the year <clears throat> looking at, oh, I think it was on um, match.com, right? And, and that people who use emoji get um, more dates and have more sex because <laughs> they are, they're conveying more charisma yeah uh -huh. you know, and I don't know I don't know if everyone I think I think it's quite interesting that probably if I think about the last 20 years a lot of people have been very um dismissive of those kinds of symbols but it's a different a different kind of code I think yeah no I love that I mean I think um you know partly we're slowly it's like you know, digital communication has stripped a whole bunch of things away and we're learning some of the downsides of what it means to strip those things away. But then people are also in these incredible creative ways, building some of them back and repurposing things and using things in a way that they're not 
um, intended in order to like be able to develop more more real relationships. And so, um, yeah, that's one of the real places I think of of hope in digital life is just like the incredibly clever and interesting ways that people come up with to deal with the homogeneity that we've been presented with or that we're forced to like interact with uh, through. Um, but all of that said, I think like, um, you know, part of the premise of Civic Signals is that we still need, um, you know, if you think about uh, a physical community, there are lots of different contexts that have different purposes. And some of those are business purposes and some of those are public facing purposes. And it feels like those public facing spaces in digital life don't exist nearly as much as they ought to. Um, and so to me, that's you know work that you've been doing that lots of people have been doing to kind of try to think about how do you build more of those spaces, but um, that's still a, a central missing ingredient if we really wanna have healthy communities online. Um, which it feels like a good time to uh, talk about parks. Um, yeah. I really love your article uh, about Thanks. that. And I think I think particularly, you know, in these weird uh, the times when many of us are uh, sitting in the, the same room, looking at the same things, <laughs> not um, being out um, wandering around, feels really important to actually actively explore those other other ways of um, being in the space I think yeah like could, yeah. You, could you tell us a bit about that sure um, you know so so one of the things that I think one of the places where I think conversation around online discourse has gone wrong is that um, it presumes that kind of the highest or best things that people can do together is like argue about politics. And I think, again, if you sort of think about, well, what are, how are our physical spaces and our physical communities organized? Like there are places like town meetings or what have you, um, town squares where people do some of that. But the vast majority of the space and the vast majority of the time isn't spent on like heated public arguments with strangers about a contentious issue. And that's because that's almost always just unpleasant and unproductive. And instead, um, you know, a lot of what we spend time with is basically creating these contexts where we can build familiarity, build a sense of like, I'm not threatened by other people and maybe, and they're kind of okay. And I can see them living their lives and having their own challenges. Um, yeah, I think the one, the one real different, big difference between kind of, you know, if you think about being with other people in a park and being with other people in a digital space is that parks are also, you know, so in a lovely way, like mostly not performative, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your thing. You're not like, you know, showing off your dance for the world or whatever, like you, you may be practicing your dance moves, but, um, it's this chance to kind of see other people being themselves. And that's a very important um, part of building a healthy uh, community because that's how you build the empathy and the understanding. And so, um, you know, I do think we need more spaces like that that put us into contact with people we might not otherwise come into contact with, but not in the context of like the thing we disagree about most, but in the context of like, we're both having a pretty good time. And it's like only when you build that familiarity, then maybe you can have the hard conversation, you know, but you need the, the relational network first. And um, I was thinking particularly about what you were saying about the different role of different bits of furniture or different spaces. And I mean, and it, it is interesting because obviously in London, there is a park that has a very, uh, the famous uh, speaker's corner. Right. Um, it is a tiny, it's, you know, it's a tiny park of a, a um, um, part of an enormous uh, space, but that actually in um, signaling the kind of behavior it's okay to, to conduct there, that yeah. actually turned that into a very uh, 
the vibrant place where people did have um, difficult conversations over hundreds of years. Yeah. But it was it was um, purposeful rather than people wandering around arg um, arguing. You know, it was, yeah. it, it was like very concentrated. Well, this is another piece, you know, again, when you observe what physical spaces have worked, um, you know, they, they are really intentionally structured. And I think there's a notion online that unstructuredness, bottom up, emergent is always good. And I think when it comes to human beings, a lot of the time that results in chaos or it results in the people who feel the most entitled to the space taking it um, rather than uh you know really thinking through well how do we want people to come together uh here and so you know this is where i think design becomes really important because building that structure into like what is this for how do we expect you know want people to relate to each other and then how do we build a process that facilitates that that's really critical but you know the other piece is that you need the people who are expert in navigating that and i think that's you know, when you think about libraries or you think about other pieces of social infrastructure, um, it's that skilled, nuanced ability to hold a bunch of different people and a bunch of different needs in one space that I think is so important. So kind of bringing this back to some of the work that our, com our community the tech um, fellows are doing, yeah. Um, whether it's kind of, if I was going to sort of draw an analogy to maybe like what they're doing in the real world with what's happening digitally, it would be like, you know, like it would be like if every community hall was owned by Facebook and instead everyone was having to either um negotiate with the, the facebook or make their own um rebel space outside and i was just mm -hmm. wondering do you do you have any advice for people who are trying to make a different kind of space yeah well i mean i think um I think there's a couple different components. So one is, is that sense of healthy spaces are kind of intentional, structured, and, um, you know, have some clear norms. And there's um, a way of kind of buy, getting people to buy into like, this is how we, how we act here. Um, and I think, you know, you can look at digital spaces that do this, like some subreddits are extremely, you know, thoughtful about how who gets to speak and how 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 speech works in order to invite um, everybody in. Um, I think another piece is, um, you know, it, uh, it does come down sometimes to just the dedication of of individual people because uh, there's a great uh, book called the public uh, the the. Uh, public life of small urban spaces, I think, um, that was looking at New York in the 1970s and where people congregated and where they didn't. And a lot of the time it really did come down to like, there was a person who made it their mission to make this a convivial space and to connect people and to make people feel welcomed, but also to make sure that bad things, you know, kind of didn't happen. Um, there's just a lot of labor there. And so I think it's partly like, it doesn't happen you know, it's not a you build it and they come. It's like a, you build it and you invite people and you tend it and it grows very, you know, slowly but beautifully over time. That's how these things tend to operate. Um, and then I think the last piece is, um, you know, I think there's an increasing number of people who are experimenting with how do you design, how do you make the kind of affordances available, as you said, to um, make this all easier for people? So that, um, you know, if you're a designer or a technologist, how can you think about what people need in order to make convivial public spaces and how can we build spaces that have more of those? And I think a lot of people are finding that, you know, there may be sort of solutions to that in the traditional VC tech world, 
but that a lot of them are going to come in different forms that are that we may need you know sort of a lot of uh, you know nonprofit or not profit oriented institutions that help design those tools when big tech companies are are not going to be interested in doing so. So lastly, I guess as a last thought, um, one of the I I quite often think that one of the one of the differences between like the real world and the digital world is like when you go into a, um, a physical space, whether or not you're physically able to, everybody knows it is possible to move the chairs around. You know, like like there's a yeah. there's a sort of knowledge that we bring to this space, and I guess kind of what do you think what do you think people sort of i don't know like how how can the ability to do that to go into a digital space and move the chairs around and make it different and make it better um how, do you think it's um possible to do that yeah i mean i think um in fact, if you look at the early web, you know, that was a, if you look at GeoCities or some of these early kind of places where people set up their, um, their online home, there was this real sense of like, I mean, to, to a too great an extent sometimes, but like people really would like go, go wild with their wallpaper and their blinking, you know, signs. Um, but, and I think, you know, there's still, uh, you know, some places where that happens online, but I think um, ultimately, you know, what's challenging is um, when we're thinking about the architecture, um, you know, as long as it's owned by these big companies, um, there's going to be a limit to like what mod modifications we can make to it. You know, ultimately we're like, this isn't the right metaphor exactly, but we're renting, we're not owners of these spaces. <laughs> and so, um, you know, partly to me that suggests like, okay, this is why we need to build some alternative spaces where we do have enough ownership that we can redesign them when they're not serving our community's needs. And that's kind of, I think the long run um, where, where there's really exciting work to be done. But the last thing I'd say is just, um, you know, all of this can feel very difficult and even insurmountable. And I just think, you know, the more that I spend time with the history of how people have thought about um, designing and creating new public interventions for their problems, like we've encountered problems like this many times before, and we've invented a whole lot of really amazing institutions and new ways of doing things to overcome them. And I, I just have a lot of faith that we can do that again with with the internet. Oh, how lovely. Um, thank you. <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, Thanks thank for having me on. Very much. Right. I'm going to I'm going to stop recording if I can.